Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Hire and Fire podcast. This is Jeremy Miller, your host. And normally I would be introducing you to Amanda Anderson, but she is not in the chair presently. But we do have an awesome guest today. Um, I have Dan Tan here with us. He is a very senior engineer, specifically in the IT space. And we'll have him introduce himself and talk about his specialty. But We're doing a focus this month on DevOps, specifically for our technological breakdown. And we kind of put DevOps and cloud in a similar category, and they obviously are connected, but he's going to be here to help tell us a little bit about himself and what he does, and we're going to have a good breakdown discussion on that. So if you're in the staffing business, you do hiring, or you're a regular job seeker, and this is not your specialty, this might be interesting. If you are in a specialty like this, Um, we're probably not going to go as deep in technological areas you might want us to, but we're still going to cover it nonetheless. So hello, Dan. Welcome. How are you? Hey, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on the show. This is good to be here. Absolutely. Dan and I have known each other for years. Um, You know, we basically work together in the sense that, you know, I'm in IT staffing and he's an IT guru. And uh, he was nice enough to come in here. So we're going to get some breakdown from him soon. We're going to do our normal news and notes show. I got some cool articles that we're going to break down. We'll see how Dan feels about them. And then uh, we'll just have a general discussion jumping on from there. But do you want to give a br- give a brief breakdown, if you would, just of yourself, how long you've been doing what you do, um, You know, just a little bit of your specialty, whatever comes to mind. So don't overthink it. Yeah, thanks. Um I've been in the Twin Cities for the last 21 years. Um, cut my teeth on really anything, uh, Linux, Windows, uh, HP, Solaris, you know, all these platforms. And like a lot of uh, peers of my uh, pedigree, it's we've done a lot of this work. And, and a lot of this work is uh, very similar. We've called ourselves system admin, system engineer, system architect, uh, yeah. many titles through the years. And uh, I find myself evolving with the uh, state of industry and have recently in the last several years taken on the, the, the practice, the title of uh, System Reliability Engineer. Yes. And that's yeah. kind of where I'm finding myself. Have you noticed that a lot of the old school, and by old school I mean 10 years ago, Linux engineers have all kind of morphed into this? Or have you noticed that some of what used to be your colleagues have gone a different direction? Uh, I, th- I think there have been two uh, branches in, in where uh, engineers... Um, technologists like myself have evolved. I, I think they're from from that particular skill set have evolved two uh, frameworks of thought. There's definitely been Linux admins who have preferred to remain full on uh, hands on keyboard. Yeah, uh, and they've become you know they are valued in this industry still. But there's a, a different uh, framework of thought that really came out of Google. You know, probably back in 2013, that kind of spawned this whole uh, conversation around DevOps and system re- reliability engineering. Yeah, and that's that's where I'm finding myself aligning. Uh, it's less, in some regards, tactical. And it's uh, elevated the, the technical skills into a more strategic-based focus. And that's that's how I presently perceive uh, this particular practice. Yeah, and what's interesting about that, too, um, is it just continues to prove that this industry evolves, right? And even when you think you've made it, quote-unquote, kind of in a technology focus, you can have something come along like a Google in the world and revolutionize something. And you almost start, well, actually, I'll just ask you, did you have a moment where you just started to see that Linux engineering generically is not maybe the most stable career path for you anymore that you had to go elsewhere? Or did you just kind of find yourself morphing with that and this was a natural progression from your perspective? I think the industry will definitely uh, hold place for both uh, skill sets. I mean, as you've suggested, the, the technology is forcing the, the change in technology is forcing the evolution of the employment around it. Yeah. And there is place for people to um, coexist equally in, in the true Linux admin system engineer system admin kind of space. But there is new uh, opportunities for people that want to be less hands on keyboard uh, to 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 take this experience that they already have and and evolve it into something that creates more value to the organization they are, they are working in yeah interesting well <clears throat> the reason why I love talking about this skill set is is it's from my perspective a different animal because basically 
DevOps was coined out of half of the word development and half of the word operations. And the idea was to get those two groups in sync, essentially, right? How is the infrastructure of a company's IT going to support what they're building from an application or database perspective? And then also flip side, how can those two teams, for lack of a better word, integrate with each other to do this quicker, better, more on the fly, and to kind of respect each other's side of the effort? Is is that still accurate or is it moved on beyond that even quicker? I, I think that's the space that the industry is in right now. And and before we get into, you know, the DevOps specifically, I kind of want to introduce the term of SRE because I, I think in the industry is presently uh, not just the employment industry, but the staffing industry is definitely using and to some extent abusing these terms without f- fully understanding what they they mean. And I'm hoping yes. to be able to uh, help unpack some of that today. Excellent. Me too. Hell of a tease, by the way. It's like you've done this radio thing before. <laughs> so we're going to tease SRE and what we're going to go with DevOps for now. And we're going to cover that in our main topic. For now, we're going to break out into the old news and notes section. We'll see if we can find anything in- interesting. So I'm always able to find a a couple of articles that are just kind of interesting on the hiring front in general, right? Like what's going on in the industry or what are people doing or what have you? So Dan's going to help me co-host this sucker. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, Good news for everybody. Uh, Here's the article for um, the U.S. job labor market. U.S. jobs growth jumps back up in October. So we had a dip in September, which is a little surprising because I think everybody just kind of generically thinks everyone's hiring ipso facto. There's more jobs every single month. And a lot of that's true, right? You see all the hiring signs. You're probably getting bombarded by recruiters like us in general. But in October, specifically 571,000 non-farm, to be specific, Dan, private sector jobs are up, which is awesome. Here's the funny part. This is the one that blows my mind. Five million job ads this year so far in e- in our economy, which is awesome. Uh, so I hope that continues to progress in the sense that we are kind of recovering a lot of what we lost from a COVID perspective. But we also see clearly that there are not enough people for virtually every job category that we have, Right. Your skill set is arguably one of the bigger factors there because in IT staffing, which is what we do here at Pyra Consulting, you know, DevOps, Java, and security have been gangbusters for years now and they don't seem like they're slowing down. I'm presuming you have the same perception or maybe different. Say that again, Jeremy. Well, we just have a few different skill sets in IT that are specifically growing rapidly and the demand for the talent is higher than the talent available, right? So in our job market economy, there's only one of two things that can be happening. We either have more people than jobs or we have more jobs than people, right? And clearly right now we have more jobs than people. But in your specific area of expertise, is that pretty consistently true from your perspective or not always? I'm seeing the trend that, you know, that reinforces your opinion. Um, I I perceive that there is definitely a shortage of uh, people speaking to a specific skill set that the companies are looking for. Um, And specifically, the technology has gotten to a state where it's so complex. Um, As much as, you know, technology was supposed to simplify our lives, but at at the enterprise level, the technology is actually very complex. Um, And having someone with the kitchen sink of uh, experience and the understanding of the nuances of the tools and the state of industry is is hard to hard to fill well the second article backs that up because this um, one says senior level positions are the hardest to fill says 55 percent of hiring decision makers that's not shocking um, you know, it by default, you would assume that it would be harder to find higher levels of skill set, maybe just assuming that there's more entry level talent available. But this this specific article has this quote, recruiting at all levels is difficult, but unskilled workers are slightly more available than other skill sets right now. So it found that um, 68% of hiring decision makers believe that it will be easy to recruit entry-level roles, 
while 63% believe that it'll be easy to recruit C-level roles. But when it comes to mid-level, that's kind of where they're struggling. Mid-level would be basically considered the highest of the non-executive level functions, right? So you're in a classic example of that. Basically, regardless of IT or not, IT, finance, engineering, doesn't matter. You know, basically the six-figure salaries are the level that people are struggling to find the best talent for, um, which could find just a gap, right? Like we in America have a gap with developer talent, right? We're not producing as a country enough developers as we have need for. So it's not shocking, but it, it makes sense that you're experiencing that just in your day-to-day as well. Yeah, I, I think there's certainly some truth to that. Uh, and I think, you know, this is this is certainly my standpoint and don't, you know, take it as the... Uh rule of thumb, but I'm, I'm interpreting that, you know, people are trying to find these senior positions and the skills that they are trying to find in these senior positions aren't as quantifiable as they would like. You know, you, you can put uh, uh, interpersonality traits or bedside manner, so to speak, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and quantify that on a scale of one to 10. And that's usually hard to capture, especially during the interview process. You can... yeah. Go ahead. You can, uh, you know, quantify technical skills, but you can quantify interpersonal skills. Have you, in your opinion, do you think it's like if 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 your employer was hiring somebody for your team, do you think it would be more difficult to find the right technological fit, or is it more that you can find that person that can do the job, but the interpersonal skills are lacking? I I. I've personally experienced two different schools of thought here. If you're looking at the uh, Fang companies, the uh, Facebook, uh, Apple, Netflix, uh, Google, um, company, and Amazon uh, interview process, you're going to you know, experience, uh, uh, for me at least, what was perceived as a very unpleasant process. Because okay. they are, they are, <laughs> the interview process is very uh, statistical. They are looking for a very specific uh, trait in their employees. And that's spawn a whole uh, micro ecosystem of people of training centers that will train you specifically for an interview process wow um on the other hand you know i personally lean to interviews and processes where they are hiring for the person because once you hire for the person in my opinion and the person has the right motivations and interest in the technology the technology can be learned yes Yeah. So your experience is the high end organizations have almost gotten a little too damn fancy with their interview process. I definitely think so. And then it's, it's at least for you personally, it's a turnoff. Yes. And do you think that's because they they feel like they're kind of special and they have to come up with a fancy dancy way of screening people out because they think they're a big deal? Or do you think they're just overcomplicating it? I, th- I think there are two schools. Again, I think that's two schools of thought. I think both the, uh, your suggestions apply. Yeah. I, I think they're at, at a scale that they are because of their interview process, and it is their interview process that, you know, is that double-edged sword that creates the same uh, um, aggravations as well. Yeah, no doubt about that. Yeah, I mean, just generically, being in the IT-related staffing area, we we see job descriptions themselves that are overly complicated with technological buzzwords, right? So our job is to try and understand at the hiring level of the department what they're actually looking for and kind of sum that down to the basic parts. Then after that, once we've identified somebody that has the skills that they need, the question then is, is this person, for lack of a better word, sharp enough to go into the interview and impress with their interpersonal skills? Not the easiest thing to find, right? So, but the days of being a coder in the basement in the corner where they just tell you to go shut up and do your thing, that's kind of over, right? I mean, you have to be able to do a little bit of both. Do you experience that too? Very much, you know, interview process is something I don't shy away from. It's it's something that I do practice actively because I think it, it, it's one of those skills if you don't use it, you you are going to lose it. So I tend to be very vocal in and my willingness to have the conversations with uh, recruiters because those conversations are free for the most part. Yeah. Um, but completely agreed. There are definitely uh, people in the technology space that, you know, can't sell themselves. And uh, there, there will be those who, who can. 
Yeah, no doubt about that. Well, all right, well, let's transition over. We just had a couple of articles to talk about today. So let's talk a little bit about you, you what you do. We're going to try and break down the technology in general, just kind of based on what your experience is. So maybe we can start right with the SRA. What the heck is an SRA? <laughs> and what is it that you do? How would you sum it up? And why is it that you think that's the skill set that either suits you or is a good place to be? Wow, that's a, quite a question there. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it's like four questions, actually. Yeah, it is like four <laughs> questions. <laughs> I think I want to back the conversation up into, you know, what is what is DevOps before getting into what Great, far away. is. Uh, and in, and for, this is just really historical perspective that DevOps, the, the, the notion of DevOps preceded the notions of system reliability engineering. Back in 2013, there was a massive, uh, a huge article uh, presented by the VP of Engineering out of Google, and he was tasked with turning a bunch of developers into infrastructure operators. So he came up with this framework of thought and methodology, and he you know coined it system reliability engineering. Uh, fundamentally, it's meant to have infrastructure operational folks uh, think about their problems with a more software development uh mindset, uh, being able to uh, not uh, deploy configurations by hand, uh, being very conscientious of making sure that configurations are well managed in some version control system. Um, and and th that kind of thought process really kind of evolved from there. Uh, as I personally see it in, in uh, two, two sentences, is really DevOps is the, the what you're trying to achieve where system reliability is the how. So you are going okay. to, uh, SRE is the how, is it's really kind of being that, that monkey on your back, telling, you know, keeping an eye on your developers or having your developers inherit a certain mindset and certain practice that they do things in a very deliberate and concerted fashion uh, with with proper discipline and care. Like, like any, you know, thing you would do in the technology space, discipline and care. Uh, and it feeds itself into these broader conversations of what value this creates for the organization. Yeah. So do you think that title itself is the most accurate description? Site reliability. Is, is, is it really focused on the reliability, the performance, the, the, the capacity to handle volume? Or is it more uh, focused on just kind of how the organization is simultaneously handling their physical network infrastructure and storage that can support an application that is running and they're either using it internally or externally. Uh, because I get the idea of, hey, we need to, we don't want to build things by scratch. You want to be, like you mentioned earlier, you want to be able to roll things out without having to manually do these processes. But is it more of the, how the groups work together or is it specifically how the technology is handled? Because I can't quite tell if it's a, a tech motivated thing or if it's a how do we get our internal IT to be operating at its maximum efficiency? I think it's both. And I think to unpack your question a little bit more, I think we need to understand what the motivation of the company is. You know, I've experienced companies where te the technology uh, uh, services are often perceived as the red-headed stepchild of the organization. It's going to cost us this, this, this for infrastructure. And uh, it, there's, no very, there's no or very little correlation of the value that technology creates to further the, uh, the objectives of the, the business as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the notion of system reliability, and I really like the term system reliability rather than site reliability, okay. uh, just because I think it encompasses a much broader spectrum of, uh, of thought, um, is, is that this practice really helps... Uh, merge the the bridge that is between the technology the very traditional you know operators of technology and and brings alignment of that to the value that the business is trying to create um, some parts of that in, include and, and it's 
capture some of the things that you mentioned, capacity and velocity, because you know developers want to move fast, infrastructure people want them to move slower. <laughs> uh, that's always been fundamentally the rub. There's the rub, right? Um, but also, you know, it captures things like like risk and change management. And uh, risk is a very big thing to an organization, especially when a lot of its business is captured through the use of a digital product these days. Um, so you do have to really understand uh, the changes that happens in your technology and infrastructure space and what risk that potentially creates to your bottom line. So do you think the effort of the VP of Google from 2013 is working and paid off and is going the direction that he kind of saw? Or did that just spawn the start of the discussion and it's grown into something different? I think it's grown into something very organic. I think he's certainly kicked off the discussion. There's obviously, you know, people in this in this space understand there's the, what we consider the Bible of system reliability engineering is that book that came out of Google. I think there's a second book now plus a workbook that accompanies it. So the book kind of speaks to the theory and the methodology, but the workbook is really something that a lot of people should take a moment to uh, look at just because it, it takes the the what he's talking about, and the workbook helps you uh, translate that into a, how you can actually leverage some of these concepts into your organization. Uh, it is certainly not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, every organization does need to adapt it to their specific uh, requirements. Yeah, so can, can you be in the upper ranks of infrastructure within an organization, IT department nowadays, and not be cognizant and aware of this can you can you stick isolated one side or the other or has that kind of been eliminated where yeah i get it that you're great at coding but if you don't understand what we're doing on the infrastructure side you're at a miss or vice versa or you know or do you have to find a company that really is a little old school that's a little uh Tricky. I, it's hard for me to tell because my particular skill set as represented on my profile seems to capture a lot of the recruiters trying to hire for SRE positions. Yeah. So it's it's a little hard for me to tell how many companies uh, are actually aware of this particular you know framework of thought and methodology that's kind of overrunning the industry, so to yeah. speak. Uh, I'm sure there, there are companies still very much operating in the very traditional model as of well. Of course. Yeah. So ha have you found yourself in an interview setting and you, you don't have to name companies, of course, but have you found yourself in a setting where you can tell immediately they aren't there yet? This is too rudimentary. I won't be able to do this. Or is that actually kind of exciting because you think you might be able to help them? I think that there is, 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 I think you touched on the fascination I have with this particular role and the motivations I have. Uh, a lot of this with system reliability engineering is, as I see it, you know, it is one part technology, uh, which is the experience you bring to the table, understanding the tools, the state of industry and so forth. But I think the two parts of this equation is really human interaction. And if you enjoy human interaction, the ability to be able to put forward new ideas and and run into those walls of resistance that that typically happen with most organizations. Humans inherently uh, are resistant to change. But if you have that kind of motivation, that kind of patience, that kind of uh, grit, so to speak, that you enjoy these kind of challenges, then you know something like like system and reliability engineering, I think really lends itself to the personality. Yeah. So, so would, would you like the challenge of going into a company where you'd have to kind of spawn this from the beginning or would you need a little bit of buy-in so that you can at least have a stick to carry around while you're trying to beat people into change per se? <laughs> I think that's, that's uh, no, I, I definitely... Because I agree, change sucks, right? I mean, it's hard for all of us. I definitely capture the humor of that. You know, I've been at both ends of this conversation before, uh, and it definitely requires uh, a grassroots sort of uh, initiative coming up from the bottom of the organization, but it definitely needs a degree of uh, technology leadership at the, at the sea table, so to speak, yeah. that can communicate the value that uh, a DevOps or SRE practice 
in the organization can create. So it's it needs to be approached from both directions. Yeah. Uh, do you see that some companies are calling a difference between system reliability and site reliability, or are they just kind of interchangeable, even though you kind of hate that? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think the term itself is overly used and abused, to be okay. honest with you. And um, I, I use them interchangeably. Yeah, even though, again, you kind of hate that. <laughs> right? That's okay. I totally understand. Yeah. Now, um, my industry, uh, maybe not wholesale, but I would just say in general, tends to clump DevOps and cloud into similar categories. Now, we get jobs that are very particularly aimed at one or the other, per se. How do you view those two buzzwords, DevOps, cloud, what does that mean to you? Do you find that the average Joe who doesn't do it, a.k.a. me, finds that confusing and that's cute to you? Or is it understandable that pe- that people put them in the same category? Oh, you're good with those, uh, you know, multi-stage uh, questions. But I'm gonna, Aren't I? I know. <laughs> I'm going to take a stab at at breaking that down a little bit. Cool. I'll uh, simplify questions moving forward to quit making your life miserable. <laughs> uh, DevOps and cloud, I, I think they are very distinct concepts. I don't think you even think they are the same, to be honest with you. I uh, agree. Uh, let me start with cloud and work backwards. So, but cloud for me is, you know, the notions of uh, where uh, AWS is uh, or Azure is mm-hmm. or GCP uh, for Google Cloud uh, GCP. Um, I can't remember the P. Platform? Yeah, something like okay. that. Okay, Google Cloud pa- Platform? Um, but anyway, that's what I consider cloud. I re- interpret that as kind of the the modern evolution of what infra- one dimension of what infrastructure management can look like. Uh, it is infrastructure in the cloud. Um, certainly not necessarily what everyone needs to do. Uh, it comes with its costs. It comes with its complications and its own nuances. But there are certainly organizations that continue to either host themselves on site or co-host, you know, on 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 premise with someone else. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> DevOps is the really the practice of having your developers inherit a more uh, operational kind of uh, perspective and methodology, and in in like fashion, having your operators inherit a more developers uh, framework of thought. So it it's a practice that really does go both ways. Yeah, because I think it would be I think it would be accurate from an IT staffing perspective to more adequately separate those two because they're not synonymous. They're two very different things, but I think they get lumped into that category with each other almost unfairly. Now, clearly, there's going to be a cloud-related component to what you're doing, but that's just assuming that your present organization is going that direction or is there already. But if you have, let's say you started a job with a company that really likes on-premise and they want their infrastructure in it, in their data center, a local data center, they don't like the cloud, that doesn't really change what you're doing from a DevOps perspective internally, does it? It does not, and and that's kind of where I'm going to you know introduce SRE DevOps and use them interchangeably here. But I I have seen evolutions of DevOps and SRE in various forms. You know, organizations wanting this to be a centralized uh, practice that kind of evangelizes it across the broad organization, as well as I've seen it in in a distributed model where you embed your DevOps SRE engineers into the the respective uh, product teams. Uh, neither have achieved significant success. And what I've actually seen is when, this is an interesting platform to try to communicate a visual idea. Um, but I, I've seen success where your your traditional infrastructure teams or cloud teams, as you may call them these days, uh, as, as verticals in the organization. Um, so you've got your infrastructure vertical, you've potentially got your uh, risk and change vertical. Um, you've got your release management vertical uh, skill sets. And these can be very specialized skill sets. And then you have these horizontal skill sets, the DevOps SRE skill sets, that I, I perceive has best uh, efficacy when, when you apply these um, in a more horizontal manner. So you've got these teams that that span a broad spectrum of of knowledge and skill and understanding the nuance of how an organization will f- function. 
And these horizontal skill sets will help you bridge the verticals, the verticals between the infrastructure teams and your product development teams that, that also operate in kind of a vertical capacity. Yeah. Um, so for your vertical teams to provide services and, and products that the development teams can consume and, and further accelerate their, their velocity of uh, deployment and so forth, and bringing these two you know, things together, so to speak, is, is kind of where the SRE skill set uh, comes into play. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Would you, would you assume that it's, is it more common that an organization is already established vertically and then your skill set, if it was to be new in an environment, would be brought in to bridge that gap across and like you said, horizontally? Or do you notice sometimes it's the other way around, that you already have a horizontal layout but you're trying to break it out into the vertical teams because they're trying to mature in size, if that makes any sense. Um, I've seen it both ways, to okay. be honest. Uh, and it's, in my experience, it's been easier to come in as a horizontal and try to bridge that. I mean, it's challenging. Uh, I mean, that's that's what we find work for. But it's it's motivating as well when you help, you know, close some of these gaps. Uh, I think the fun for me, at least, is identifying the gaps and how... Um, how similar I've, I've observed these gaps to be uh, regardless of the organization. And I've seen a lot of organizations in, in various states of evolution and maturity along the same life cycle. Yeah. So what's interesting to you about your current situation? You're in a team of four or five. Um, are, you, are you guys presently trying to get to one of these areas where you brought in to help this effort or... Um, where, where are you guys presently, just to, out of curiosity? So I'm, I'm in a team of four or five. Uh, the effort is a new initiative within the organization. It is defined as a uh, SRE team for, for whatever that weight carries. Um, that said, um, it is very greenfield. Uh, and in the, in the notion of a maturity scale, in my own uh, perception, you know, they are a little low on this, lower on the scale. Um, so there is a lot of opportunity for learning. There's a lot of opportunity for growth, um, and that's that kind of gets me. Uh, that that's fun for me, uh, and it's not always you know uh, sleeves rolled up, you know, banging on the keyboard. It's a lot of con- communication. There's a lot of conversation going on, understanding the the gaps and challenges that the organization is having, and then being able to capture that into a format that that makes sense. And that's consumable. I, I think one of the things that that facilitates change is uh, what's the term? You know, when you are trying to initiate change, uh, make make it easy. Uh, when you make change difficult for a team or a person to adopt, it, it's often going to be abandoned. But when you can make change as fluid and as elegant as someone can consume then then the, and they see the value that the change would provide them uh, it enables them to to adopt these new practices much easier and much faster yeah i mean i'm going to absolutely derail on another topic but you spawn something because literally when i hear you describe that i just hear the notion in my brain of just make it make something easy to buy and that's not just necessarily buying some type of retail product but your effort is essentially, if I'm hearing you right, to try and make the change as easy to accept as possible, as opposed to coming in with a bulldozer and just plowing everything to the ground. Because even if you have, like you said earlier, the C-level buy-in and the executive, so you're getting this message pushed down the ranks in a good way for the message that you're trying to evangelize, you still need the emotional buy-in for these teams, even if there's a quote-unquote directive above, right? Otherwise, you're going to get pushback from people that even if they're not supposed to, they're still fighting you on this, right? Do you run into that a lot or not really where you have to literally convince people outside of threatening to go to their superiors, right? Because who wants to do that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and, and I think I think it... No, you, I think you just nailed it right there. Um, I, I think there is a notion that there needs to, for for an SRE team there needs to be a notion of multiple tools in your skill set. I, I think there is absolutely a need for 
the ability to be very diplomatic and delicate in the way you communicate so as to get the results that you want. But there is also a need to, for different teams, obviously, the the ability to wield that big stick. So I think, depending on the circumstance, you either use that big stick or use the carrot. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I lose my mind in retail settings when you're in a situation where you want to buy something, but where you are, they've made it difficult to do so. And that's infuriating, even if it works for them. I was at a store at the Mall of America recently. I think it's a COVID thing. Don't don't quote me here. But the, it's the M&M store of all places. Have you been there by any chance? Absolutely. Okay, so I'm I was loving the idea of this peanut M&M sweatshirt for my son for his birthday, right? Bright yellow. In my opinion, fault me or not, I'm 100% (laughs) right on this. Peanut M&Ms are my favorite. I think they should be everyone's favorite. And they had a process where you could only get into the store in one location. So technically, they used to have the ability to walk in on the first floor, on the second floor, and there's actually two locations on the first floor. But they've tried to turn it into a kind of a flow where you walk into the store and then you walk through and you exit in one area. Sure. Here I am on the second floor wanting to buy a sweatshirt and they're telling me that I'm trying to walk into the exit. So I need to go downstairs and I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, I ain't going downstairs. So you just lost a customer there. Can you please make this easy to buy for the love of God? Now, I know that's a silly retail example, but that matters, right? I mean, if you're trying to change people's either behavior to do something with you or you're trying to encourage them to consume something. Who cares what it is? The harder you make it, the more likely they're not gonna. And they might even just fight back on you for illogical purposes of the fact that they don't like it. And that was me. You know, so I mean, of course I could have gone down the damn escalator. And of course somebody on a team that you're fighting with having to do with a release or a process or who cares, they could easily just comply but if it's perceived as annoyingly difficult or they don't get it, then they're more likely to circumvent what you're trying to do. And yeah, you might have the stick per se, but it doesn't mean that you want to use it or that you're actually getting people on your side by forcing them to comply. So what's, what, what seems to work the best? Are you naturally gifted at diplomacy? Or have you found that you either you or your teams tend to use the stick more often? No, I would not claim any uh, natural capacity here. I think it really is a part of evolution, maybe even age. But, you know, I, I think that's learned over time, practiced over time. Uh, and there really isn't really isn't a, a, an exit strategy or an exit criteria for diplomacy. It's really a journey for me. As much as I would say the same for you know what system rely, as much as I would say for and reliability engineering as a whole, it isn't or shouldn't be um, a goal for an organization to hit a point of reliability because the technology around you is going to constantly evolve. So mm-hmm. the organization as a whole does need to inherit. A, a, a DNA almost of of recognizing that reliability needs to be something everyone practices and that it is a journey, not not something you can do once and say that you are done with it. I like your point about the maturity because I was laughing inside because I've personally experienced that as well. Let's just say I'm not as big of a dick as I used to be. Uh, and, 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 I, and that is an age maturity thing, uh, whether it be the type of person that you want to be or just growing in skill or acquiring a little more patience. But, you know, that can be a really tough thing to do. I'm wondering, and maybe you'll agree, maybe now that DevOps isn't this brand spanking new shiny thing that people don't get, like now that it's grown beyond that, do you think that's a lot of the credit where there's kind of just an assumption that we are doing things differently? Or or is it more of just an individual thing as to whether or not a certain team member or whatnot? Like, do you find that in your job on a daily basis, you have certain groups, aka verticals, that fight this more than others? And everybody kind of knows it, that the blank team across different companies tends to hate this more than others or not necessarily? 
I don't think there's that. I've not observed at least any That's team good. that <laughs> that good. fights this. I do have observed that every team fights this. Okay. Uh, you, 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 <laughs> so not one particular group. It's all of them. <laughs> it, it's, it is really all of them because change, change is hard. No, that's totally fair. Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> from a technological perspective, it, um, you know, is 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 this something that you see growing elsewhere? Like, do you see a future for it, whether it's five years out, ten years out, or w- what do you kind of see on the horizon per se? That's a great question. Um, I've seen some organizations, at least some. Uh, Consulting uh, consultancy uh, organizations turn this into a a product, um, mm. and that's been very intriguing for me. Not not many, but very few that have turned reliability engineering into a product. And I think there is there, there is market space to consume this as a product with the recognition that again, you know, there it goes back to my notion that you know it's a journey, not a goal. So there is a little bit of conflict of thought. You know how you would potentially uh, sell sell a product that really needs to live on in the organization itself. Mm-hmm. What you could potentially come in with is, is a methodology that you kind of leave the organization to keep uh, evolving themselves. Broadly as an industry, I see this role continuing to evolve, uh, not necessarily change, but the fact that organizations are starting to recognize the value that such a thought process um Offers the, the the offers the organization as a whole, um, yeah. That's that's kind of where I am. Um, I had a thought, but I've that slipped my mind. No, that's okay. That happens, obviously, to the best of us. Yeah, because uh, system. Re- I'm gonna have to try and get that embedded in my brain because I look at SRE and I see site, and I'm really gonna, for your sake alone, Dan, I'm gonna go out of my way to try and change that to system uh, because I think that's a big deal. Um, this is the, the, the IT landscape of the professional business world started as a, can we take a manual process and automate it essentially, right? Anything from typing something instead of writing it or what have you. I think we've effectively grown past the idea that IT is not just meant to be something that keeps the lights on. Like it actually can be used to grow the effort of the business do you think people in general in the IT world see that too? Or do you kind of view them as, or do, do, do IT folks in general, and I know this is a big general statement, do they kind of view what they do as separate from what the company itself is doing? I think you've identified a very broad spectrum there. And I, you know, I, I am in no position to classify that, but oh, sure. I think organizations. There are many organizations that exist on that very broad spectrum, and a lot of that is contributed to a lot of uh, individuals like myself over the span of their career, moving up the uh, management and leadership uh, uh, spaces of organizations, and Mm -hmm. as you are finding... Uh, more uh, individuals like that moving into those leadership positions and evangelizing the the value that they see technology, it is shifting the landscape of how organizations uh, behave and regard their technology uh, components of their business. Which is actually nice because you, for one, like a challenge, like presently you're in a greenfield scenario and for you that's kind of enjoyable, whether it be free to spread ideas or you can just help them get somewhere they haven't been before. I would assume there are people like you in your skill set that are the other way around, that they would be turned off by a position that would be in a quote unquote green field scenario. Do you run into people like that that would like would not want to be in a setting like you are now because they kind of need the company to be further ahead? Or do you think the idea is just kind of so fun that it doesn't really matter. It's just hop in where you're needed. A uh, little bit of both. I think I'm of the personality type. I hop in where I need it. I'm definitely can be very asinine and and critical of my personality and critical in personality as well. And <laughs> I, I think that that's a skill set I've leveraged to be able to come into an organization, be the new blood, so to speak, and and ask the why questions because you know the, the more tenured and senior employees have gotten to a a point where they've started taking things for granted and they they think that, you know, that's how it's been and that's how it's going to be. So 
I come into an organization and I ask what is often, you know, I, I coin the stupid questions that people have stopped asking. And that kind of promotes, you know, that thought process of why are we doing it this way mm-hmm. and can we do it better? So if, if you were helping mentor either a college kid or someone, you know, two, three years into an IT career about how to get where you are, is there kind of a quote unquote career path? Because for me, it used to be pretty simple, right? Admins turn into engineers, engineers can turn into architects. It doesn't seem that linear anymore. So is there kind of a, yeah, have you noticed there's a pedigree? Like does, do most people in your skill set come from the infrastructure ranks and merge kind of with a development mindset? Or have you equally noticed that a lot of your coworkers and colleagues were former developers? That's a that's a fantastic question, and I'm surprised you're not scripted. Uh, I got nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's always been why I've enjoyed our conversations. Um, no, I've seen it from both sides, and I okay. think that, ho- that the holy grail is really: does a developer make a better DevOps engineer, or does a infrastructure, you know? Uh, pedigree engineer make a better DevOps engineer? Okay, that would have been a better question. I think you used to sum that up a little more succinctly than I did. But what do, do you do? You feel like you would you lean one direction or the other, or it's kind of one of those chicken and eggs? I, I don't think it's a chicken and egg. I think someone offered me some perspective into this question a, a while ago, and I think it's very appropriate. It's, it's the fact that it doesn't take one DevOps engineer to to, to run an organization. Uh, it takes developers who have be, come into this role as well as infrastructure people who have mm. come into this role. And I think the the uh, the boiling pot of various skills and perspectives is is what contributes to a. Uh, effective team, yeah. uh, grow you know growing and moving forward as as a whole. Uh, I I know it sounds like a very uh, generic kind of answer, but I I've started to appreciate the answer for for the nuance that it means. Yeah, because, but I but it, I don't think it's generic. I I think it's actually um, shows progress, right? Because if you have folks that are thinking that way. I would assume that they've therefore gotten rid of the old mentality of developer over there, infrastructure engineer on the other end. So there's kind of a presupposition of willingness, for lack of a better word, on both sides, which you, th- that's kind of where I see the progress. Do you kind of see where I'm going there? I completely agree. And I kind of want to go back and touch on the question that you asked, you know, just, just before this, is how sure. does someone come up into a role yeah, like please. this? and uh, I, I'm not sure there there is a particular curriculum or, or path. You know, I've been doing this for a very long time, and I've touched on many aspects and dimensions of, of the industry, uh, you know, picking up various knowledge and skills along the way. And I, I think the role and the title has just evolved into, mm-hmm. into what it is today. But if you would go to college and seek out something like this, you would come out with necessarily, you know, you come out with an academic understanding, but not necessarily a very broad uh, perception of how organizations really function. Yeah, and that's the tough part, right? Like you can only teach so much in school. If you're going to school for IT right now, you're probably in some type of comm science degree, I would presume. Um, and then there, from there, like for me personally, I studied IT in college and learned pretty quickly that development is not meant for me. I can do this, but it doesn't suit me. I'm not a big puzzle guy. It's not kind of my uh, forte, for lack of a better word. So ironically, I studied development and then started in IT on the infrastructure side. Mm -hmm. And that worked better for me personally. And I think what you're saying is it's good news in regards to where these skill sets are merging. Because if, if you're in one or the other, you're not screwed to be able to move around. They can go either direction. Um, I personally kind of view your role more typically coming from the infrastructure rank. But that very well could just be my perception and the fact that I lean that direction. Uh, so it seems like it's a little bit of both. So for example, like what has stopped you from ever going into development? Even though you you and I both know in your role, you code all the time. There, There is a very nuanced uh, distinction uh, between you know what I do with the tools like uh, Bash, Shell Scripting, Python, Go, 
Rust, um, and and what a developer actually does in in preferably the languages you know C, Java, and so forth. Mm-hmm. I, I think there is a different framework of thought, a different uh, style of writing code that doesn't uh, lend itself well to each other. Mm. And as I suggested earlier in the conversation, uh, the role of en- reliability engineering I I see is less so uh, hands on keyboard and definitely has matured or evolved so to speak into uh, two parts of being a change agent in the organization Mm. uh, leveraging the technical skills that you've brought to the table do you miss the keyboard aspect just because it if, if I'm hearing you right it's diminished a tad it's diminished a tad but not completely yeah uh there is still enough hours of the day that you know i have to understand the technology enough and have to get into the the python that you know some someone else has written um and decipher it and then make the the uh, amendments or the corrections so that it will function better yeah no that makes sense yeah, and and maybe that's the difference of of tweaking. Um, I'm I'm trying to think of the right word, you know, because when I think of what you're doing to automate something, uh, you know, I always perceive those scripts, for lack of a better word, as just being an add-on, a tool, a function to do a specific thing, as opposed to building a wholesale application or working on a particular module for blank. And maybe that's kind of what you meant from the distinction of coding via C sharp, Java, et cetera, compared to utilizing Python code to do blank. For the most part, correct. Yes, yeah. I mean, I, I the thing with automation is it's an evolutionary uh, process. It's an evolutionary arc almost. You know, you start by finding a problem, and I'm going to bang this keyboard, this command out on the keyboard, and you know, it's going to do A, B, and C. Yeah. And then you know, as as we are all lazy engineers, uh, <laughs> you you write a bit of Bash script or Python to you know say I'm going to run this Python script, and it's going to run those eight commands for me in a more consistent and reliable way. Is, is that how and why you morphed into this? It, d- did you start seeing this coming because you noticed what used to be my job as a Linux admin, engineer, system admin, whatever the title is, was you noticed that you were starting to automate things for your own job to be better. It's starting to realize that, hey, this is kind of where the whole department is going. Or not necessarily. Do you follow what I mean by that question? I, I do. I don't, I don't think it was necessarily a, a conscious observation or distinction. Yeah. Or, uh, as much as it was just kind of really evolving with with what the industry was doing. Yeah. And then the third step, you know, after you've written these these bits of code that you still have to run yourself, then you start looking at the the orchestration tools uh, of the industry, things like uh, Jenkins or or uh, Ansible or Terraform that takes these uh, components of automation and then gives you the ability to, to scale it to a, a whole new level. Hmm. Um, so as I mentioned, that, that evolutionary arc of, uh, of being a lazy engineer. <laughs> in a good way, right? In, in, a, good in way. a good way, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, everybody gets better at their job, um, not only by experience, but also learning which corners to cut and which not per se. So like you on your team right now, do you guys have specialties or is it more of just kind of grabbing a particular project for lack of a better word and running with it? Or how do you guys break that up presently? Uh, we've identified certain uh, initiatives that the organization needs and, and gaps, so to speak, uh, where things are ripe for improvement Mm -hmm. and we are kind of uh because the team is is as small as it is um we are taking uh kind of initiatives and leadership roles uh to go uh take these ideas and expound on them and uh, create documentation on them create uh, processes and methods around them um and then you know coming back every week or so and sharing the progress with the team um cool do, do, do you are you empowered to go find those or do you have work direction that says this particular initiative needs attention per se uh both because this is such a small team uh and i i think that i think that really captures what i enjoy about these 
kind of engagements and these greenfield initiatives is that it's not been done before, so you really can screw up being the first to attempt. <laughs> you have a little more luxury of um, asking for forgiveness as opposed to permission, per se. Precisely. <laughs> exactly. That's great. So, um, how's the new role going? You're working remote exclusively. Um, I know you've done a lot of that. Do, do you prefer that? Do you miss on site? You know, we've been in COVID land now for going on two years, unfortunately. Yeah, I've been I've been remote for uh, a little bit longer than COVID pre okay. pre COVID, and you know, it's coming pushing on two years now, maybe okay. a little more. Uh, but I I would be hard pressed to say that I would enjoy going back into a an office environment anymore. Just just because, I mean. I, I'm comfortable. I I, yeah. I get more done at home. And I, there's no need. Yeah, right. I mean, there's there's so much flexibility in in the nature of the work. You know that that technology affords. Uh, we meet, um, and the organization does. You know, make the efforts to make sure that you know there are uh, organizational or team level uh, yeah. meet and greet events in person, so that you do have the opportunity to build some of that water cooler time. Totally. Has that worked for you? It's actually interesting. You know, have you? Have you noticed that an effort to keep connectedness in whether it be your group, department, whatever, has is it working? Or do you feel like some people just kind of don't feel a part of the mission because they're just not physically walking in the building anymore? I think there's been a mental shift. And I think there's been a mental observation and shift in my own uh, practices and, and, uh, and the way I operate from home than if I were to operate in an office environment. Mm. And I, I'm finding that when you're functioning remotely, you, you do have to make the, the effort to be a little bit more uh, chatty mm. or, or vocal, even if the, the platform is a Teams or Slack, mm -hmm. to, to make sure that your efforts are recognized and heard. I mean, I mean, some people would probably call that a little bit of brown nosing, but I, I, I think the efforts need to shift a little bit because you're not always being able to, you know, be able to have that human interaction. Yeah, but, I, you know, I would push you on the brown nosing thing just because I think you're doing it on purpose, right? Because when you're in the office, sometimes you seek out connection with others, but a lot of times it just happens, right? That's part of the fact that you're physically there. You run into somebody in the bathroom, in the lunchroom, or what have you. Or in the parking lot, for God's sakes, right? So if you know those things are not going to manufacture themselves, you're intentionally trying to get out there a little bit. Agreed. Yeah. Yep. And that's a little bit of a new venture for us. Um, as I mentioned to you off the air beforehand, we're starting to move to a partial hybrid model. And by that, I don't mean individual employees having three in the office, two out. It's more of a we have teams that are in the office for a purpose, and then we have a team that's out of the office for a purpose, and I'm presently trying to develop what you described as the organization's attempt to, to develop connectedness, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm the one personally going, how can I make sure that these people feel a part of what the hell we're doing? And if they're in a completely other state, it might just be a thing like con connecting regularly on Slack, and it's just a chat thing or fly people into the office once a quarter or something along those lines. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people like you that really enjoy that. And then let's face it, right? If your employer came to you tomorrow and said, get in the office, you're going to know quickly in your brain whether you want to do that or not. And you know damn well how many opportunities there are in the country for you to work remote. So I think companies, arguably, even if they don't want to, are gonna have to understand that to compete for talent, you're either gonna be okay with the fact that you're x name 60% of your potential staff, or you just have to adjust accordingly. It sounds like you might've found one that gets it. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I think you just nailed it. I mean, there is a competition for talent right now. It goes back into our earlier conversation of how challenging it is to hire for a mid-level or senior engineer right mm -hmm. now. And they, they don't grow on trees. They, they are, you know, a creation of time and experience and, and nurturing. Yeah, no doubt about that. Well, awesome. Hey, thank you very much for your time. It was great having you here. And I did learn a lot because a lot of these skill sets, you know, even though I talk this all day, I don't do this. Uh, you know, so it's really interesting to hear kind of the methodology around it and how you view that. I think it's good news for the up and comers for what you said earlier. 
where there, there doesn't have to be one way to get into this role. And there used to be a lot of notions in certain skill sets where if you didn't come from a certain group, you just weren't going to ever get in there. And hopefully wholesale across verticals, like you said, that if IT continues to trend this way, it will be even easier to cross apply people to different jobs, right? And if you're interfacing with groups that you never used to talk to before, there's a lot more possibility of gaining those skills, gaining those relationships in other areas. So maybe we can continue to get out of this, what vertical are you in and you're stuck there category. There's been a notion in the staffing business forever that if you're meeting a business analyst and you're trying to understand what project experience they have, they will very quickly tell you that they can BA anything. Right. And I think on some level that's true, Mm -hmm. but from a marketing placement hiring perspective, you get pigeonholed pretty quickly. And sometimes that's good news if that means good pay. And other times that could be frustrating if you think you're stuck somewhere. Right. So, all right, cool. Good stuff. So here's what we'll do. Whenever we, whenever we get this show out there, we're going to add Dan's information, tag him on LinkedIn, and we'll put his info in the show notes. So As you can hear, this is a smart guy. Uh, He's working, uh, but nonetheless, feel free and reach out and connect to him. We'd love to have you back at some point. Yeah, we know someone's going to come hammering at you. And you don't work for us, so this is not a selfish plug. (laughs) That's for sure. But, uh, Dan, very much appreciate your time, and it's always good to see you. Of course. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again for listening to the Hire and Fire podcast. Uh, This is going to be our first of two uh, DevOps episodes, uh, and then we're going to continue to build some vlog series around these. So you might have me build one of these later on. Uh, Feel free and interface with us. Check us out on our website, pyraconsulting.com. That's P-I-R-A. Same on LinkedIn, same on Facebook, et cetera. And as mentioned, we'll add in the show notes for ways that you can connect with Dan or learn more about him. And we'll be back again with another episode of the Hire and Fire podcast. See you, kiddos. Thank you for listening to the Hire and Fire podcast brought to you by Pirate Consulting. Please check us out online via LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or at our website, pirateconsulting.com. That's P-I-R-A consulting.com.